So there's a little boy outside and he got his little horn off of his bike and he's and he's blowing it. And he's going around the house, or going around the house just honking this horn. And his dad gives him a little time. He's like, all right, maybe he'll stop. Let's let it go for a little bit. But the boy doesn't stop. Doesn't stop. So he finally goes, I said, son, what in the world are you doing? He said, dad, I'm keeping tigers away from the house. He said, son, there are no tigers around our house. He said, yeah, it's working. <laughs> Sometimes we presume to understand things that we really don't have clue about. And other times we think that our actions are the force and the effectual power behind some outcome. And this is also true in our spiritual lives. We presume sometimes to know the mind of God, to have an idea of what God's doing in our life or maybe in somebody else's life. When in fact, we know from Isaiah 55, 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, God says, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We also can sometimes assume that our acts of obedience, our acts of faith with other people bring about God's kingdom in our own power. And that we are maybe the force behind some spiritual growth in somebody else. And the reality is, that's not the case. Just like that little boy assumed that him honking that horn was keeping tigers away. He was deluded. We sometimes are deluded the same way. Thinking that what we're doing is bringing about that change in someone else spiritually. Well, the subject of today's sermon is the nature of God's kingdom. We're going to be looking at Mark 4, 21. So if you're not there yet, open up your Bibles or the Pew Bible in front of you to Mark chapter 4. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark. And um, last week, last two weeks, we looked at the parable of the soils. And as Wes prayed, the difference between someone receiving the word, the Gospel of Christ, and not, really depends upon their heart preparation. On that heart being tilled and ready to receive the seed of the word and it growing into 30 and 60 and 100 fold as jesus says sometimes that's a hard path that seed just bounces off and doesn't get planted in but either way it's the heart preparation of the individual that determines the effectiveness and the productivity and the person that does that is god god prepares the hearts God tills that soil in the heart to prepare it. So we're going to see our role, the results of sharing the gospel, recognition, and reassurance. We're looking at four little stories, little parables in, in Mark 4, verse 21 today. And these four little vignettes or parables are going to give us a picture of God's kingdom, of the gospel and of God's kingdom. And as I said, we're going to see the role, our role, the results of sharing gospel, of the gospel, recognition, who should we recognize, and a reassurance for those that are participating in the spreading of God's kingdom and the growth of God's kingdom. So if you uh, have Mark, and even if you don't have Mark, um, you'd stand with me as we read we just stand to read god's word to just say this is not just any book this is the inspired word of god and we give it the respect that it is due mark 4 verse 21 and he said to them is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest nor is anything secret except to come to light if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. 
And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and he rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them, and he, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So parables. We've been talking a little bit about parables. Parables are stories that kind of have a surface meaning. But then they also have a deeper meaning. And in this case, when Jesus is using parables, he, they, have a, they have a surface meaning that everybody can understand. They're not concepts or things that are, you know, really difficult. He's talking about seeds growing. He's talking about wheat. Um, he's talking about planting. These are things that would have been very common and very well understood by those in the area of Galilee. But then there's another meaning. There's, a, there's, a, there's another point to it. There's a deeper meaning and really a spiritual meaning. We said these aren't so hard like calculus um, or maybe for some of you algebra. Um, this is not difficult in the sense that it's really hard to figure out. You have to really work at it. It's more hidden to some extent that once you know the meaning, it's, it's obvious. And um, Jesus gives us these little parables, and they talk about the gospel, they talk about the kingdom, and as we see this, it's kind of a continuation for Mark from this story about the soils. We call it the soils. Some people call it the parable of the sower. We call it the parable of the soils. Now, Mark, the gospel of Mark, um, we said, I said that I think it's one of the first gospels written. It was written to the Romans. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of doing. There's not a lot of discourse. In fact, this is, a, this is an uncommon section in Mark where you get Jesus' words and the stories. But Mark compiles it in a manner that he puts them together all, all in a way that makes a point about the kingdom and about the gospel. If you look at, if you did a little cross-reference on your phone or on, in your Bible and look through cross-references, you would find these phrases, all these little parables in Matthew and in Luke, but they come at different times and in different places and in different contexts. And Mark puts all these together to, to, to tell us something about the gospel. And as I, as I mentioned, last two weeks we talked about the parable of the soils. And we said that the gospel doesn't change between these people. It's the same seed that is sown. So the gospel doesn't change. The sower doesn't change. In fact, not very much is, is, is put on the emphasis, is put on the sower, on his actions. But they all have differences. Some, nothing happens. Some, it grows up quickly and then fades away. And others, 30, 60, and 100 fold. What's the difference? The difference is the soil and the preparation of the soil. And he even tells his disciples, that's the heart. The soil is the heart. And when someone has a heart that's prepared to hear the gospel and it's shared with them, then God causes supernatural growth. Growth that's beyond what we would expect. So that's kind of our context. If you weren't here the last couple of weeks, we talked about that parable of the soils. And now he continues with that theme here with these parables. Let's look back at the first one, verse 21. A lamp, is it brought under a basket or a bed and not under a stand? What's the surface meaning here? The surface meaning is that lamps bring into view things that are unseen, right? When it's dark and you can't see something and you have a lamp and it brings light, you can now see things that were hidden, that were in the dark, that were unseen. And furthermore, he's saying you should use a lamp where it's effective, where it needs to be used, not under a, ba in a, under a basket 
then the basket would cover the light or under a bed, uh, unless you're looking for that, you know, change or that, you know, I lose things all the time. So I'm always needing light under the bed. That actually would help be helpful at my house to have a lamp under the bed. It's usually where my glasses end up. And I find, where are my glasses? I have four pair of glasses under the bed from the nightstand that get knocked over. But anyway, um, the point is then though, deeper than that. Is he really talking about a lamp? Is he, is he really saying, hey, guys, when you go home, don't put your lamps under baskets. No, he's saying, a yeah, lamp should be used to, to make hidden things seen, and it should be used in the proper place. And for us, the gospel brings hidden sin into view. The, the gospel exposes it. And he's saying to his disciples, the gospel should be used to reveal that. We don't, we don't take this word, this light, the truth of Jesus and of the kingdom, the, new, the knowledge here that Jesus is bringing, and we don't hide it away. We don't put it somewhere where it's not going to be effective. We bring it out and we shine it in the darkness. We talked a little earlier in, in this section before this in, in verse 11. It sounded like Jesus was almost saying, you know what? We don't want people to hear the gospel because maybe they'll hear it and they'll be forgiven. And I said, I really think he's just saying, stating if they did hear it, they would be forgiven. That obviously Jesus is not saying don't share the gospel because now he's showing us clearly the light is supposed to go where it's effective. We are the light. The gospel is the message of the light of Jesus Christ. And we need to take that to the darkness. We need to take that to people that don't know about it. We need to use the light to expose sin and reveal sin and darkness. So it's both two things that what light does, that it reveals things, and that this lamp should be used not in places where it's ineffective, but it should go and be used in places that are effective. In other words, he's telling his disciples, you guys are going to go into the dark, and you're going to take the gospel, this light, the truth of the kingdom, into the light, into the darkness, and bring light there. It's verse 22 it says, for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Now, when I was a little kid, one of my favorite memories, age five, this bank opened up in Fremont, Ohio, where I was living. And this bank got those Susan B. Anthony dollar, dollar coins. A whole, and back then, the dollar was worth a dollar. It, it was it would, a little more buying power than it does now, but it still was a dollar. They hid thousands of these coins in the dirt of the soil where they were going to build, and they taped it off, and then they let kids run in and dig in through the dirt and get as many coins as, as, you, as you could. And it was mayhem, right? They're like, go! And then you're running through, digging through the dirt, getting coins, and they were right there on the top. I mean, it wasn't like deep down in. Why did they hide those coins? Because they intended for them to be found. And Jesus is saying, this is a hidden message. Yes, it's hidden. And we, we talked about why he was hiding this message from some of the scribes. The scribes came to him from Jerusalem. They had already seen him heal, do miraculous things. They saw the power of God through the Holy Spirit do amazing things through Jesus. And what did they call Jesus? Demon-possessed and said that you are of the devil. Basically, you're doing these things of the devil's power. Almost like a sorcerer. And Jesus told them, that, you know, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that's the sin that's not forgiven. And you have committed an eternal sin, basically, you scribes, who have hardened your heart so much so that you don't recognize the work of the Holy Spirit right before you, right now, and you're attributing that work to the enemy, to Satan. And so then he starts veiling this message to where the truth is being explained, but their eyes are not seeing it. They're not understanding it. They hear it, but they don't understand it. They see it, but they don't really perceive it. But there's a time coming when that which is hidden will be revealed. Go with me to the right a little bit. Mark 9. Mark 9, verse 9. This is right after the transfiguration. Remember the transfiguration? 
Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the three that a lot of times he brings closer to him. These three, he comes up and he takes them to a mountain. And he's there, and they see an amazing transformation of Jesus. They see him basically glorified. I mean, his, the white becomes super white. There's light, there's shining, and they're, they're blown away by this. And they're, they're standing, Jesus is radiant. And, and while he's standing there, Elijah and Moses are talking with him. And then they, they hear a voice say, this is my beloved son. And suddenly they look around and see nobody but Jesus. They are blown away by this. Verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen. This is hidden. Until when? Until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this matter to themselves, questioning what the rising of the dead might mean. The point is this. If there was a veiling of the message in some way for the disciples to veil, he was telling them, the lamp one day is soon, and it should be taken it's not to be hidden. It's to go out. And you are going to share this message of, of mine, the gospel. That's the whole point of this. Why did Jesus pick these men? That was his plan. Twelve people to take the gospel to the world. And each of us, is, in, is we are the fruit of one of those twelve men and some of his other followers possibly, but really those twelve disciples. They were able to transform the world through the gospel just by sowing the seed. And he's saying, it's not for you to keep. It's not for you to take this lamp somewhere, hide it, put it somewhere where it's not effective. Take the lamp where it's on a stand, where all can see it, and go. Our role is to share the gospel, not hide it. We have something that breaks through the darkness, that reveals that which is hidden. Our job is to share it, not hide it. All right, let's look at the next little parable, verse 24. Back to Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 24, he says, And pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For the one who has will be given more, and from the one who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. The surface meaning here is reciprocity to your actions. If you do... A little bit, a lot will a little bit will come back to you. If you do a lot, a lot will come back to you. And in terms of spiritual theological meaning, I think it's that the more you listen and pay attention to the word of God, the more you will benefit. The openness you have will determine the outcome. And this is, I think, really hearkening back to the parable of the soils. It wasn't the gospel was changing, it wasn't the the sower was changing, the what was changing? The receptivity of the person. When you are listening to God's word and you're open to it and you're paying attention, he even says, he has ears, let him hear. Pay attention to what you hear, Jesus says. The measure you use, it will be measured back. In other words, pay attention and how much, pay, how much attention you pay, how open your heart is to that, that will determine what you get out of the message from God, from God's word. Just like the soils. Those who are not open and don't listen, what happened to that path, that seed on the path? Who came and took it? it was Satan. Satan. It was the birds came and took it away. And Jesus said, that is Satan taking that word out of that person's heart. And if you're not receptive, if you're not open, if you're not listening to God's word, it'll get taken away. So that's where this concept, I think, of even what you have will be taken away from you. If you don't have it, if you're not, if you're not using much if you're not measuring with much the thing that you get god's word that message will be taken away from you he says listen so our our point of this is the more we listen to god's word the better the result will be in our life and the more receptive we are to god's word the more impact that will have in our lives that's true in the gospel when we share that with somebody that's true for us when we hear it too that receptivity determines the outcome and how we listen. <laughs> Just thinking about listening to your spouse, right? I mean, 
how many times your your wife are, is talking to you men and um, you're you're hearing words you're not really listening to those words you may even be looking in the direction of your spouse you're thinking about something else and i apologize women for having to be married to men because that's just how we are we like i'm thinking about my stomach or dinner or whatever something or football or what happened in, in, and, I'm, and I'm looking and, and Deborah sometimes has to say, did you hear what I'm telling you? Did you, did you hear? I think just yesterday she said those words. Or do you, do you hear the words I'm saying to you? I'm hearing them. I wasn't paying attention. No, I wasn't listening. So let me, let me, could you repeat them again? Hang on. I'm ready now. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. That's what Jesus is saying here. You hear the words, but don't just hear it like a typical husband Listen, listen with your eyes, listen with your face, listen, focus the direction to God and listening to his word. Let it fully hit you. Think about it. Respond. That's guys, just a little heads up. How our wives know we're listening is we respond to them in affirmation of something that they've said. So just a little heads up, just use this. Some of you guys have this master and I'm learning from some of you guys, but um, the younger guys, you get to learn, work on that. Zach, you think about that. Put that jot the note down, okay? When you get married, you listen and respond. And that's what God wants us to do. Listen to him, listen to his word, and respond. Oh, have be that receptivity to God's word. All right, Mark 26, the third parable. The seed growing. I love this. This guy, <laughs> this guy would not probably have a farm very long. If he, he just, he just throws some seed out and he has no idea how it grows or what's going on. And he goes to bed, he wakes up and he goes to bed and he wakes up and somehow the wheat grows and there it is. It's ready to go and he, and he gets it. And the point is not about the farmer here, is it? The point is about who is causing the growth. On the surface, this message is saying nature is so powerful that if you just get a seed into the ground, it can take its course and it can grow on its own and, and it can produce because it's amazing. The theological impact of this is that we don't understand really what's going on when harvest comes, when, when someone has a life-changing experience, transformation in their lives. We really don't understand that. That's God working in their heart. We can at least just say, I understand that God's doing that work. And it doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on me. The, the transformation of a, of a life through the gospel, it's not about me toiling. I share the word. I share the gospel. Then I go to bed, and I get up, and I go to bed, and I get up. And then I see transformation in somebody's life, and I say, that's God. That's God's word. Yes, I sowed the seed. But the point here Jesus is making is that person who sows, it's just like in the parable of the soils. It's not, the emphasis isn't on the sower. There's not one adjective about the sower in that parable earlier in chapter four. He's saying the sower throws the seed out. He doesn't know what's going on and it grows. And that's the case for us too. The kingdom of God grows and we don't understand it, and we have a part in it, but it's not dependent upon us. I love how R.T. France puts it. He says, the kingdom of God then does not depend on human effort to achieve it, and human insight will not be able to explain it. It doesn't depend on human effort to achieve it. In other words, God doesn't need us to bring about his kingdom, and human insight will not be able to explain it. We cannot explain what's happening in the spiritual growth of people, other than to say, God's doing a work. His word is effective, and he's doing a work. All right, verse 30, a lot of these little stories. The mustard seed. What can we compare the kingdom of God to a mustard seed? Now, before you go home and, and start um, Googling, is mustard seed really the smallest seed in the earth? It's not. So why is Jesus saying that? He's talking to the people of Galilee, and he's saying, when it is sown, it's the smallest seed in the earth. It is one of the smallest, or the smallest seed in the earth that is sown, that they take and they actually plant. Now, mustard seed, one millimeter in diameter. 
That's the, the length across it. It's a little sphere. It's a little globe, right? Little ball. It would take 25 mustard seeds together to make one inch. That's how small it is. Does that help you kind of visualize that? Because millimeters, like, we don't do metric. We do, we don't, I, don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. Millimeters, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now we're talking inches. Oh, an inch. I know what inches. In one inch, 25 of them be that, that long. Okay? It grows up to be much larger, four feet tall. Do you know how many times taller that is than the one millimeter? 1,200 times the size of the seed, four feet tall. And it has branches and it gets bigger. Probably was, a, it was called a black mustard seed, was probably what Jesus was referring to in that area. So think about that. 1,200, 1,000 times the size of that mustard seed to plant height. That's pretty impressive. And what is the point on the surface? The point is through small things, big things can be accomplished. Even if something is very small, something big can be accomplished. I think mustard seed is a great analogy because Jesus used it. But if he was here in our day and age, how many of you have used mustard seeds? Has anyone ever planted a mustard tree, mustard plant? Probably not. I think maybe uh, this is obviously very good for that area, but let's bring it to us. Oak tree. Everybody knows what oak tree is, right? What do, what do oak trees come from? Little acorns. Cute little acorns, right? Little acorn. The average acorn size is 1.5 inches long. The average height of an oak tree, 60 feet. <laughs> do you know how much an oak tree weighs with its... With everything, roots, an average oak tree. I had to do a lot of calculation on this and, and looking up and researching. 30,000 pounds, a, a oak tree, 30,000 pounds. You think about how heavy a, a log is when you're carrying a log. All of them together, then there's as much of the tree under the ground as there is above the ground in its root system. 30,000 pounds from a little acorn that just weighs, I mean, you can throw it light. Isn't that amazing how God created that? God gave us so many pictures through life, through nature, of his power, of his creativity, of his economy, of how things work in the kingdom of God. This is just one more of those. A little acorn grows into this huge tree of 30,000 pounds, 60 feet tall from one and a half inches What's the theological impact? <clears throat> Small spiritual efforts can have huge outcomes. Don't discredit or discount something that immediately looks like a little small gain spiritually because God can use that to grow it exponentially into an oak tree from an acorn. Jesus reassures his disciples here, don't lose heart. You're gonna get, you're gonna be discouraged sometimes. You're gonna say that just was a little acorn. That was just a little you know mustard seed. That's that was nothing. God can take that, make it into a mustard plant, make it into an oak tree. Spiritually, the kingdom of God will grow by God's power, not yours. And He can take a small act of faithful obedience and change it into a movement of repentance and life transformation. Mark ends this passage saying, with many parables, he spoke to them, and he didn't speak to them without using parables, and privately he told the disciples everything. Does that mean Jesus only spoke in parables? Jesus, what would you like for dinner? Well, there once was a man who wanted a fish. No, he did speak in discourse. He used lots of different ways. Mark actually almost always presents parables when he talks about Jesus's teaching and his point was he used them all the time whenever he spoke he used parables he would tie them in but again if they were hidden it was hidden to those who he knew were past that point of receiving him that were in front of him that experienced the the holy spirit working saw the power of god working through him in a miraculous way and attributed it to Satan. That's the only time we hear conversation and words like that, as harsh as Jesus says 
in terms of unforgiven sin, sin that w was beyond repair and eternal sin. But Jesus spoke in, in the parables, then he would describe to the disciples. Why did he describe to the disciples? Because he wanted them to take this knowledge and just go hide it away. Here's these, here are these coins, here are these coins, and here's this knowledge, and I want you just to go take it now and go hide it away so no one can see it. Is that why he did it? No. He gave them this knowledge so they would go share it, so that it would be found. So that just like that bank did, you would invite people together to come find the hidden treasure, the gospel. Take your lamp out, your light, and shine it. Here's your application. Take a small step this week to share the gospel with someone. Take a small mustard seed, acorn size step this week to share the gospel with someone. Going back to our prayer, care, and share. We started that this summer. This emphasis of talking about prayer, care, and share. Prayer. Be strategic about prayer. Pray for someone. Think about them. Write it on a card, their name, so you see it. Maybe somewhere where you like the, the where you brush your teeth, where you, you get ready, somewhere where, where you're gonna see their name, that you're thinking about them. In your car, little little card with their name on it. Take a walk in the morning or the evening. Pray for your neighbors by name. Pray at the end of the day or whenever it is that you have a prayer time. And be strategic. Be consistent in praying for somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Pray expectantly. Ask God to prepare their hearts. Pray for that soil to be prepared. And that they would receive the gospel. Then care, prayer, care, care for them. Think of a way. What's a way that you can do something for this person this week? Help with yard work as the leaves are going to be falling soon. Maybe they're going to need help with, with that. Caring for their pets, cooking them a meal, inviting them to your house for a meal, just sharing your home with them, making or cooking a dessert for them. No big cookies for me, by the way. All right. <laughs> Show your concern by asking them how you can pray for them. That's another way that you can care for them. Hey, how, how can we pray for you? We're praying for you. Prayer, care, share. Pray for God to give you opportunities to start the spiritual conversation. Ask some questions that lead in that direction about their background, their, their spiritual journey, their church background. Share your testimony. Share how God has taken you from darkness to light, how you are in the kingdom of the Son of God. And then share the gospel, God's holiness, that he's our creator, that we sinned, that because of that, we have judgment, wrath, that God came to us. Jesus became a man, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, and then rose again, and he invites us to come and do the same, to die to ourselves to sacrifice our lives at the altar to become a Christian, to become a child of God, and to repent and then be transformed. As you take that small step this week to share the gospel with someone, remember that God is the one who has to work in their heart. If the outcome is tremendous, give credit to God. Don't walk around thinking that you've done something in your power to affect spiritual change. If the outcome is minor or negligible, be encouraged. God can take something that appears to be small in our eyes and do great things through it.